All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this session of Tech Niche 2023. Uh, this event is by IEEE CS of VIT. And my name is Naisha Mishra. I'm from the junior core of IEEE CS. And the topic I would like to present today is sorting algorithms. I included the poster that they made and posted on their Instagram because I actually really like it. I think this is a really nice poster. And uh, yeah, if you're here on a Sunday, Christmas Eve, 9 p.m., you must really like sorting algorithms or you're part of the club. In any case, thank you for joining and tuning in. Um, yeah, all right. So moving on to the meat of the matter, sorting algorithms. Oh, oh also I used a Jupyter notebook so that I could show markdown text and uh, Python code and its output at the same time. And uh, after saving it, I rendered it in a HTML format. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just saying this for ease of presentation. And uh, all right, coming back to sorting algorithms. The algorithms we will do include your primary sorts, that is bubble, Insertion, selection, merge, and quick sort. Uh, I also include tree, heap, uh, counting, and radix sort. And I also included uh, some other more fun sorting algorithms that build upon your primary sorts. And that includes your bucket, comb, shell, and pigeonhole, and tim sort. Uh, you'll notice I've also included the time complexities uh, below each of the sorts here and uh, we'll discuss them further as we delve into each sorting algorithm in detail. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's move on to the first sort, uh, bubble sort. Uh, so I've given it quite simply here. Uh, bubble sort is the simplest sorting algorithm. It works by repeatedly swapping the adjacent elements if they are in the wrong order. Uh, it's not suitable for large data sets because its average and worst case time complexity is quite high. Uh, I wrote it right over there. It's uh, on square. Uh, I'll explain how it's on square later if, uh, when we look at the code. And uh, all right, coming back to how the actual algorithm works. Um, so you traverse uh, from left, uh, left to right to the end of the array, and you compare the adjacent elements and the higher one is always placed at the right side. So in this way, the largest element is moved to the rightmost end at first. And then this uh, process is continued to find the second largest and place it and so on and so forth until the data is sorted. Uh, advantages, it's easy to understand and implement. If you're a beginner, it's really easy to understand. Uh, it doesn't require any additional memory space. Uh, it's it's a stable sorting algorithm, uh, which basically means that elements with the same key value, uh, by same key values and identical elements, they maintain their relative order in the sorted output. Disadvantages of bubble sort include, um, for one, its time complexity is quite high. O n square is a uh, fairly inconvenient time complexity. So it makes it really slow for large data sets. Um, it's also a comparison-based sorting algorithm, so it requires comparison operator. And uh, when you use that to determine the relative order of elements, it can limit the efficiency of the algorithm. Uh, despite this, where is the bubble sort algorithm used? Uh, it's simple, so it's used to introduce the concept of a sorting algorithm. Uh, it's popular in computer graphics uh, for its capability to detect a tiny error like a swap of two elements in an almost sorted array. And uh, you can fix it with just linear complexity, uh, O2M. Um, I included an example in a polygon filling algorithm uh, where bounding lines are sorted by their x coordinates at a specific scan line, that is a line parallel to the x axis, and with incrementing y, their order changes. Uh, that means the two elements get swapped only at intersections of two lines. And uh, what is the boundary case for bubble sort? So bubble sort takes minimum time, uh, order of n, when elements are already sorted. Hence, it is best to check if the array is already sorted or not beforehand to avoid O n squared time complexity. 
uh, it takes maximum time when it's in the completely reverse sorted um, manner. Uh, I included an image to display how the algorithm works. This doesn't. Uh, this image doesn't actually represent the sorted output, but it represents how the algorithm works. As you can see, we have uh, the given algorithm, 1, 4, 2, 5, minus 2, and 3. And as you can see in later steps, we first compare 1 and 4, then 4 and 2, swap, then 4 and 5, then 5 and minus 2, swap, 5 and 3, swap, and uh, we keep uh, comparing and swapping until we get a sorted output. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's move on to the Python program for the implementation of bubble sort. Uh, OK, so here uh, I decided to use a bubble sort function for an array. Uh, the first line, uh, n is equal to length of r. I'm taking the length of r. And then we traverse through all array elements uh, with a first for loop for i in range of n. We introduce a Boolean variable swapped equal to false. And uh, then we introduce a second loop uh, for j in range, o to n minus i minus 1. And uh, this will help us uh, traverse the array from 0 to n minus i minus 1. Like, uh, say, if n is 5 and i is 1, we will traverse the array from 0 to 5 minus 1 minus 1. So yeah, uh, here after this, we include the comparison operator if r of j is greater than r of j plus 1. And we swap if the element found is greater than the next element. Uh, we I used a uh, single line swap. Uh, you may have noticed in other implementations that you can also use a temp variable. That's also fine. Uh, I just find this a bit quicker, and I'm kind of lazy. And yeah, upon doing that, we... Uh, uh, call the boolean variable swapped equal to true and uh, if swapped is equal to false we break and uh, yeah that's basically the end of your def bubble cert array oh and uh, i forgot to mention this so there are two for loops here and because of that the time complexity is o n squared whenever you see a for loop uh that isn't uh, incrementing by any non-linear value it's uh, time complexity like it's added is uh, a factor of n so yeah, this is our bubble sort function. We have the driver code. As you can see, this is our given array. Um, and uh, it works, because this is this output. This is our sorted array. And uh, yeah, that was bubble sort. Now moving on to insertion sort. Uh, insertion sort has the same time complexity as bubble sort, so does uh, selection sort, uh, just stating that beforehand. And uh, all right, so insertion sort is a simple sorting algorithm. Uh, it works similar to the way you sort playing cards in your hands. The array is virtually split into a sorted and unsorted part. And values from the unsorted part are picked and placed at the correct position in the sorted part. <clears throat> to sort an array of size n in ascending order, you will iterate over the array and compare the current element that we take key uh, to its predecessor, uh, basically the element that's right before it. And uh, if the key element is smaller than its predecessor, then you compare it to the elements before. Then you move the greater elements one position up, and uh, that is to make space for the swapped element. Uh, it's one of the simplest algorithms. This bubble and uh, selection are super simple. <clears throat> uh, it's also efficient for small data values, similar to the other two. And uh, also, it's adaptive in nature, so it's appropriate for data sets that are already partially sorted. Uh, this uh, makes sense given its time complexity, O n square. So you want to use uh, simple to understand algorithms like this only if you have an already partially sorted data set. Uh, also, it's an in-place sorting algorithm, which means it doesn't really take extra space to sort the arrays. So it is, al and also it's stable because of the whole uh, relative order of uh, same key elements is maintained. And uh, yeah, number of elements is small when input i is always sorted. Yeah, 
Uh, coming to the boundary cases of insertion sort. Insertion sort takes maximum time to sort if elements are sorted in reverse order and takes a minimum order, minimum time, sorry, order of n when elements are already sorted. Uh, in reverse order, like I said, O in square time complexity. Uh, all right, moving on to the pictorial example. Uh, as you can see, we are given an array. Uh, 4, 3, 2, 10, 12, 1, 5, and 6. And uh, as you can see, first we've taken 3 as our key. We have compared it to its predecessor 4. Uh, and we swap them and we keep doing this so on and so forth with your 2, 10, 12, 1, 5, and 6. And uh, yeah, you can see how we have um, <clears throat> uh, virtually split it into a sorted and unsorted part and uh, continued comparing the key with its predecessors and successors within the array. And thus we get a sorted output. Um, all right, coming to the Python implementation. Here also I've used a function to do insertion sort. So def insertion sort of r, uh, we traverse through one to the length of r. Uh, we could have taken a variable like we did in bubble sort, but I didn't here. Uh, and um, the reason we took the range from 1 to length of r is because we want to take the key as um, r of index i. So if i starts at 1, we're already taking this second element. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but like the second element that is 3 in this array as your key. And uh, that is essential. So we uh, move elements of r0 to i minus 1 that are greater than the key to one position ahead of their current position uh, with you know your j is equal to i minus 1 and while j is equal is greater than or equal to 0 and key is less than equal less than <clears throat> r of j uh yeah we equalize them and swap them that's basically how it works um we have also written a driver code to test the same as you can see, the given array 12, 11, 13, 5, and 6 gets sorted. Uh, and uh, this is the output right below it. And uh, yeah, insertion sort. Now that brings us to selection sort. It, it is at this point I will check if I'm actually recording. I'm actually recording. Let's go. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, selection sort. Selection sort is a simple and efficient sorting algorithm. So you repeatedly select the smallest or largest element from the unsorted portion of the list, and you move it to the sorted portion of the list. Uh, similar funda of sorted and unsorted, but uh, this is selecting the smallest or largest element uh, instead of just uh, selecting a key and inserting it here and there, uh, as is an in insertion. So this algorithm repeatedly selects the smallest or the largest element from this portion of the list, swaps it with the other, and this process is repeated for the remaining unsorted portion until it is sorted in its entirety. Advantages, simple and easy to understand, works well with small data sets. Oh yeah, this is also because uh, time complexity, worst case and average case is ON squared. Uh, that's a disadvantage. And uh, moving on to more disadvantages, uh, it doesn't work well on large data sets for obvious time complexity reasons. Uh, it also doesn't preserve the relative order of items with equal keys, identical items. So it's not stable. And uh, also, it is an in-place algorithm and does not require extra space. I didn't mean to put this in disadvantages. It's just an extra point. Anyway, uh, moving on to the pictorial example of selection sort. Uh, as you can see, uh, <clears throat> The first subarray we've assumed is between 29 to 98, and the second is from 13 to 36 in this given array. And uh, as you can see, we've picked the smallest element and uh, the smallest element in the second subarray, and the first uh, element in the first array. Uh, compare and swap, and as you can see, we traverse uh, through the actual given array while comparing the um, ith element in the first subarray to the smallest possible element in the secondary. 
uh, we keep doing this until we get a sorted output. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> now coming to the Python implementation. Uh, so you can see we've been given this array 64, 25, 12, 22, and 11. <clears throat> so um, we traverse through all the array elements. Then uh, for i in range of len of a, obviously. Then we find the minimum element in the remaining unsorted array. We take min index as i. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, uh, we're taking <clears throat> the, we're, we're trying to find the minimum element uh, first, and then we, in this line of code, swap the minimum element with the first element of the subarray. And yeah, this uh, the second for loop helps in uh, determining the second subarray. And uh, yeah, this is basically how your selection sort works. And we have a driver code, uh, as you can see. Uh, 64, 25, etc. to 11 is your given array. And here is your sorted array output. And uh, yeah, so that brings us to the end of the first three easiest sorting algorithms, uh, bubble, insertion, and selection. Now we move on to slightly more difficult, but also primary sorting algorithms. That is your merge and quick sort. Now merge sort, uh, it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Uh, so it works by dividing an array into smaller subarrays, sorting each subarray, and then merging the sorted subarrays back together to form the final sorted array. In simple terms, you can say that the process of merge sort is to divide the array into two halves, sort each half, and then merge the sorted, sorted halves back together. This process is repeated until the entire array is sorted. Uh, this has a recursive implementation. Uh, it's a recursive algorithm. Continuously splits the array in half until it can't be further divided. And uh, that is the array has only one element. And uh, we always assume that an array with one element is always sorted because obviously. Then the sorted subarrays are merged into one sorted array. Now moving on to applications of merge sort. Uh, you can use this to sort large data sets, which, if you recall, wasn't an application of the previous three. Merge sort is particularly well suited for sorting large data sets due to its guaranteed worst case time complexity, that is O of n log n. Uh, in external sorting, it's also commonly used where the data to be sorted is too large to fit into memory. And also custom sorting. Uh, merge sort can be adapted to handle different input distributions, such as partially sorted, nearly, or completely unsorted. Uh, fairly adaptive. Now, other advantages of merge sort include uh, stability. It's a stable sorting algorithm, which uh, by this point, I'm kind of bored of saying this, maintains the relative order of equal elements in the input array. Then uh, there's also a guaranteed worst case performance. Um, where it sort has a worst case time complexity of O and log n, which means it performs well even on large data sets, major plus point. And also it's parallelizable. Uh, it's naturally parallelizable, so it means it can be easily used to take advantage of multiple processors or threads. Just uh, works better with diverse operations. And uh, however, there are some drawbacks as well. Space complexity. Uh, merge sort actually requires additional memory which is uh, different from the first three. So it needs it to store the merged sub arrays during the sorted process. Um, it's also not an in-place sorting algorithm, so it requires additional memory to sort you know, to store the sorted data. This is an advantage in applications where memory usage is a concern because sometimes you're starved for memory. Uh, it's also not always optimal for small data sets, funnily enough. Um, it has a higher time complexity than other sorting algorithms, such as um, insertion sort. Like, you know, in your best case, it's O of n, correct, for um, insertion sort. So this can result in slower performance for very small data sets. Uh, really small data sets can have, you know, if they're almost sorted, they can have a uh, complexity of just O of 2 of n, like we saw in the bubble sort thing, or O of n. And in that case, it doesn't make sense to use merge sort. Merge sort, you use it mostly for large uh, data sets. And also if you have memory. 
And uh, yeah. <clears throat> I need water. Anyway, moving on to the pictorial diagram of merge sort algorithm. Uh, I took a small data set, even though I just said you shouldn't use it for a small data set, but that's fine. We're using it to understand. Uh, we have 38, 27, 43, and 10. And as you can see, you divide it recursively into two halves, and then you divide the two halves into further two halves. And as you can see, uh, they're swapped, sorted, and finally merged back together to give you the sorted output, 10, 27, 38, and 43. And uh, yeah, moving on to the Python implementation of merge sort. Uh, yeah, so I used a function, uh, merge sort of R. And uh, if, you know, the, okay, so this is um, a recursive algorithm. So first, uh, that means you have to apply a condition. Uh, the condition we applied is if the, um, length of the array is greater than one because as we said if the length of array is equal to one it's sorted we first find the mid of the array length divided by two then we divide the array elements conveniently from uh, left to mid and uh, mid to the rightmost end and um, so then we recursively sort the first half sort and divide the first half and we do that with the second half and uh, yeah, we keep doing this until, you know, length of r is greater than one. And uh, then we take three variables, i, j, k, we copy data to temp arrays, l, and r that we introduced. And uh, yeah, so here in this chunk of code, you can see that we're uh, comparing and uh, sorting. And uh, this is another chunk of code that checks if any element was left you know, just sort of uh, traversing it one more time and checking because uh, you have to merge it back. So you do have to account for any stray elements. And uh, yeah, uh, this is the code to print the list. We used a function here. And finally, there is your driver code. So the given array we took, uh, I know I'm highlighting the output, but uh, the given array we took was 12, 11, 13, 5, 6, 7. Uh, it sorts it pretty fine, and the sorted array is 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, 13. Um, one thing you'll notice is that this guy's time complexity is also roughly O n log n, and it's more apt for this because um, you'll notice it's not uh, almost sorted either. So this was a proper job for the algorithm to do. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, that's the end of merge sort. Now moving on to quick sort. Quick sort, uh, yeah, it's also a divide and conquer algorithm. Uh, kind of works a bit similarly to merge sort. So you basically uh, you pick an element as a pivot, and you partition the given array around the picked pivot by placing the pivot in its correct position in the sorted array. So um, the key process is a partition algorithm. The target of the partition is to place the pivot, uh, which also can be any element, at the correct position in the sorted array. And then you put all smaller elements to the left of the pivot and all greater elements to the right of the pivot. Uh, like a pivot to a seesaw, you want to even out both the ends. So partition is done recursively on each side of the pivot after the pivot is placed in its correct position and this finally sorts the array. Uh, coming to the partition algorithm, the logic is simple. So we start from the leftmost element and we keep track of the index of smaller or equal elements as i. While traversing, if we find a smaller element, we swap the current element with r of i. Otherwise, ignored. Uh, so moving on to the second part, that is your quick sort. Now, as the partition part is done recursively, it keeps putting the pivot in its actual position. Uh, we've applied a condition here in the code. In the sorted array, then repeatedly putting pivots in their actual position makes the array sorted. Uh, yeah, so this is the pictorial diagram <coughs> that I use to explain quick sort. Um, so we partition around 70. We just took 70 as our pivot. 
Uh, usually it helps to take the central element as the pivot, but it uh, doesn't really matter. It's just easier for you to understand. So yeah, you partition around 70. Uh, as you can see, when you split it as per 70, you get these two sub arrays, 10 to 50, 90, and 80. Then uh, <clears throat> you partition around 50 in this left side. Then you partition around 40 and 30 and so on until you can sort everything. And you do the same for the right part. Kind of looks like a tree, isn't a tree, is not a tree. And uh, yeah, okay, moving on to the Python implementation. So recursive algorithms. <clears throat> so you define pivot, sorry, define partition. <clears throat> sorry, partition from array to low to high. Um, we're choosing the rightmost element as pivot here. We're assuming low is the least and high is the highest index. And uh, yeah, so then we choose the pointer for the greater element, that is i is low minus 1. Then we traverse through all elements and compare each element with pivot uh, for j and range low of high. Uh, then we compare. If the element smaller than the pivot is found, we swap it with the greater element pointed by i. And uh, we swap the element at i with element at j. Uh, as you can see in this single line swap. And then we swap the pivot element with the greater element specified by i. <coughs> so array of i plus 1, you can see the single line swap I did for array of i plus 1 and array of i. And thus, uh, final line, we return the position from where the partition is done. And then coming on to quicksort. Uh, recursive from array to low to high index. If low is less than high, you find the pivot element such that the element smaller than the pivot around the left, element greater than the pivot around the right. Do this recursively. Pi, our variable pi, is partition of array to low to high. Uh, you can see that if low is equal to high, this is our condition for recursion. And uh, then we do a recursive call on the left end of the pivot, quick start array of low to pi minus 1. Um, as you could see from here, the left hand side is that part, and the second recursive call on the right side of the pivot uh, that is your array pi plus one and high. And you do this recursively, and then you're done. We also put a driver code to test the same. As you can see, the given array was uh, this 10 to 5, and um, we called the function, and as you can see, the sorted output array is as such. It works. Let's go. Uh, yeah. Uh, so these are um, our primary sorting algorithms. These are your fundamentals. These help in understanding everything else. Now let's move on to some slightly more interesting examples. Uh, counting sort. Now I personally don't like this, but uh, that's fine. So counting sort is a non-comparison based sorting algorithm that works well when there is limited range of input values. Uh, it's actually um, frequency based. Its basic idea is to count the frequency of each distinct element in the input array, and then you use that information to place the elements in their correct sorting positions. Uh, it's particularly efficient when the range of input values is small compared to the number of elements to be sorted. And uh, yeah, coming to the algorithm itself, <clears throat> you declare an auxiliary array first, count array uh, of size uh, max of input array plus one, and you initialize it with zero. Uh, basically, just a huge uh, array to fit uh, the size of each element, and uh, it just happens to be initialized with zero. Then you traverse the array, your input array, and you map each element of input array as an index of count array. That is, you execute uh, this chunk of code right here. You'll see it later in the code. If you don't understand, no big deal. Then you calculate the prefix sum. Again, if you don't understand this, you'll get it in the pictorial diagram. And then you create the array output of size of n. And you traverse this and update this 
put another chunk of code that you will understand later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, we'll go over the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, counting sort uh, generally performs faster than uh, all comparison-based sorting algorithms. Yeah, maybe that's why I don't like it. I like comparison-based more than frequency. But it's faster. It's faster. So if the range of the input of the order is um, is of the order of the number of input, counting sort is easy to code, arguably is, and uh, it's also a stable algorithm. Now, a disadvantage, it doesn't work on decimal values. We'll see this one later sort that does work on decimal values. Uh, and also it's inefficient if the range of values to be sorted is very large. So basically any large data set, you want to use a divide and conquer algorithm, so you're not going to use counting sort. Uh, if you want like a small or medium sized data set, then uh, it makes sense to use counting sort because it will be a bit faster than your uh, <coughs> first uh, three, that is your bubble, insertion, and selection sort. Now, counting sort is not an in-place sorting algorithm. It uses extra space for storing, or sorry, for sorting the extra, sorry, the array elements. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll just go over this guy's time complexity real quick. Where is my index page? Counting sort of n plus m. You'll notice this later in uh, <coughs> the code that I'll show. Uh, also, I forgot to say this, quick sorts, time complexity is O of n of square, uh, thereby it makes it a bit more similar to your big three easy sorting algorithms. And uh, yeah, now moving on to counting sorts pictorial diagram. Uh, okay. Yep. All right. So as you can see, we have this input array, uh, 8 to 3. And we've uh, basically indexed um, a separate array uh, from 0 to 9 to conveniently fit each size plus 1 of the input array. Uh, it's not shown on this diagram, but uh, you initialize this array of size uh, 0 to 9 with zeros. And then as you traverse uh, the input array, you'll notice uh, with this arrow right here from the 8 within the input array to the 8th index of the count array. Uh, you'll see that it's mapped out accordingly uh, to uh, frequency. And this step here, 8 minus 1 is equal to 7, this is your prefix uh, sum that I mentioned right here. Calculate the prefix sum at every index. And uh, when you do this, you get back to your input array and you're able to sort it and thus forth. Uh, yeah, also one thing about counting sort that I didn't mention, it really works, be, it's stable, right? So it maintains the relative order of your identical equal elements. And uh, it makes sense because it's a frequency uh, based algorithm rather than comparison. So if you have a bunch of identical elements and you have a medium data set, uh, this is the algorithm that will work best for you. Uh, yeah, so now coming on to the Python implementation. <clears throat> so I used a function for counting sort, where first I find the maximum element of your input array, then we initialize the count array with zero, then we map each element of input array as an index. Uh, as you can see, for num and input array, this is the mapping part. And then we calculate the prefix sum at every index of count array for i in range of uh, 1 to m plus 1. Uh, prefix sum, so you have to start one element ahead, obviously. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> find the prefix sum, then you create the output array from the count array. And then for i in range then of uh, input array minus one, uh, minus one increment, minus one end, we <clears throat> thus <clears throat> uh, create and display the output array as follows. This chunk of code right here does that. Uh, finally, return out in, uh, output array. <clears throat> and uh, then we use a driver code to test the same. Our input array is this thing from 4 to 9. And uh, 
run it through and it works. One, three, three, four, five, five, nine, and twelve. And uh, yeah. <sighs> Man, I need water. Um. Okay, so moving on to <clears throat> radix sort. Radix sort is a linear sorting algorithm that sorts elements by processing them digit by digit. It is an efficient sorting algorithm for integers or strings with the uh, fixed key, uh, fixed size keys. Um, <clears throat> so rather than comparing the elements directly, the radix sort distributes the elements into buckets. Uh, this shouldn't be confused with buckets, but we'll move on to that later but it, comp it distributes them into buckets based on each digit's value by repeatedly sorting the elements by their significant digits from the least significant to the most significant radix sort achieves the final sorted order now the key idea behind radix sort is to exploit the concept of place value it assumes that sorting numbers digit by digit will eventually result in a fully sorted list uh, if you remember, like grade in uh, grade school, you sort of learn to do the same thing. You compare the hundreds, the tens, the units. Uh, radix sort does just that. So it can be performed by using different variations, such as the LSD radix sort or the MSD radix sort. Now I've included an example here. Um, there's another one here pictorially. But we'll go over this typed example because I liked it more. To perform radix sort on this array, 170 to 66, we follow the following steps. Uh, step one, uh, we found the largest element, 802. It has three digits. We iterate three times, one for each significant place. Each one has a bucket. Then we sort the elements based on the unit place digits. We will use a stable sorting technique such as counting sort. Uh, counting sort makes sense because frequency based of any identical digits sorts just the same. And we sort the digits <clears throat> at each significant place. Now sorting based on the unit place, perform counting sort on the array. And the sorted array based on unit place is um, as follows, 170 to 66. And then we sort the elements based on the tens place digits. Uh, then when you sort it based on the tens place, you do another counting sort for the same, uh, 802 to 90. And then finally, when you sort the elements based on hundred place digits, you perform a counting sort, of course. And the sorted array based on that is thus your final array. And uh, you return this value. And the array is now sorted in ascending order. So the final sorted array using radix sort is 2, 24, 45, 66, 75, 90, etc. to 802. And uh, yeah, so this is a pictorial diagram where you sort values into ones, tens, hundreds, place units. As you can see, we move on to units, to tens, to hundreds to sort. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And, uh, okay. Now, quick note. Is radix sort preferable to comparison-based sorting algorithms like quick sort? So, if we have uh, log n bits for every digit, log 2 n bits for every digit, the running time of radix appears to be better than quick sort for a wide range. Uh, however, the constant factors hidden in asymptotic uh, your O of n notation are um, higher. Sorry, not that asymptotic is your T. Sorry, it's your big O. Are higher for radix sort and quick sort uses hardware caches more effectively. Um, also, radix sort uses counting sort as a subroutine, and counting sort takes extra space to sort numbers. So, radix sort um, works better with bigger numbers, bigger as in like more bits. Uh, to the numbers. So, uh, yeah. Moving on to the Python program for the implementation of radix sort. A function to do counting sort of array according to the digit is represented by exp. 
Uh, all right. So first, death uh, counting sort. We already went through counting sort once, and uh, we'll go through this anyway because it's modified. So the output array elements that will have sorted array uh, multiply, you know, initialize the count array as zero. Then you store the count of occurrences in count. Then change count of i so the count of i now contains actual position of this digit in output array. Then you build the output array, and then thus you copy the output array to the new array so that this array contains the sorted numbers. Uh, same funda really. The only thing is that uh, you'll notice that uh, this chunk of code that I've highlighted here, it uh, helps iterate over each bit of the given uh, <clears throat> uh, of the given array digits, uh, of the given numbers in the array having multiple digits. And uh, yeah, so this works for that. And now moving on to the method to do radix sort. So um, as we went over that example, we find the maximum number to know the number of digits. Then we do counting sort for every digit. And uh, note that instead of passing digit number, uh, exp is passed. So i is the current digit number. I don't know if you can hear that. I hope you can't. So, um, yeah, you can see this chunk of code. EXP works better for this particular uh, wide range uh, type of implementation. And uh, thus, we move on to the driver code to test the same. Uh, this is our given array. Uh, as you can see, 170 to 66. Call the function, and thus, you have a sorted output that is basically the same as our example. So, uh, yeah. All right, now we will move on to your trees and heaps. I really like tree and heap sort, so I'm excited for this. Um, yeah, okay. So tree sort, uh, it's based on the binary search tree data structure. Um, if you haven't done this in huge detail, a binary search tree uh, is just sort of um, a binary tree, as you can see in this pictorial example, uh, that just so happens to give a sorted output when you do an in-order traversal. That is when you go from uh, left to center to right over and over again. So yeah. So basically what a tree sort does is it creates a binary search tree from the elements of the input list or the area, and then you perform an in-order traversal on the creator binary search tree to get the elements in sorted order. Uh, this is a really uh, key feature of uh, the binary search tree. It's an order traversal gives you a sorted list. Uh, and its algorithm is, uh, so you take the elements input in an array, you create a binary search tree uh, by inserting data items from the array into the BST, uh, perform an order traversal, and that's it. Uh, pretty simple. Maybe that's why I like it. Um, application with tree sort, most common use is you edit the elements online. After each installation, a set of objects seen so far is available in a structured program. Uh, so as you can see here, I have on the left a BST. And on the right, the actual flowchart. So uh, in A, you can see how it's getting, how the BST is getting constructed, you know, in real time, if you will. The green elements are getting sorted, and the red elements are, have to be sorted. They're unsorted right now. And uh, moving on to the flowchart in B, so you begin. Uh, if your left subtree exists, you call Z again uh, recursively for the left node as a root and the output data from the last node. And then if you, ch you check if the right subtree exists, then you call Z again for the right node as a root and then you end. If no, you would jump forward and, you know, if no for either left or right subtree, you jump forward and uh, you either end or you just output data from the last node. Don't mind whatever I put in C, that is uh, irrelevant 
to this case. Uh, yeah. All right. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so tracert algorithm Python implementation. <sighs> so you build a BST, and then you in order traverse that we already know. So you create a class node, and then you have to initialize the BST data structure. Uh, yeah, uh, def initially indefinite self and val self and val is equal to val we initialize it with nothing on the left and right of that node and uh yeah so while you're creating your bsd you have to have an insert function so def of insert of the self tree of value so if the value is less than self of val and uh, self of left is nothing then the self dot left is equal to node of val. That's basically you inserting the new value to the left of the existing value on the left side because that's how BSD works. Similarly, you do that um, for the right side. Uh, as if if the side right side is null or none, then you just assume that the entire right tree is equal to that. Uh, if that isn't the case, you'll notice that there is another two lines of code for each case, left and right. You just self dot left dot insert. Uh, you keep doing this recursively. This is where the recursion part comes into play, and you do the same self dot right dot insert of val. And uh, in the case where you're just um, making a binary tree for one element for reasons unbeknownst to mankind, self dot val is equal to val. Fair enough. All right. Now, moving on to the in order traversal. This is also recursive. I love recursion. Uh, def in order root of rest, these are your parameters. If root, if root is there, condition, uh, we recursively call in order uh, for root.left to the result. Part res is obviously the result. And then you uh, append the value of the root to your result, and then you do the in order traversal of uh, root to right uh, and the result. Uh, basically, you're just mo like, uh, how do I show this? So, moving to A, you're basically just moving, say, from 8 to 17 to 18, and you're doing this over and over again for every little three member tree in this massive tree. Uh, yeah, and uh, now. Moving to def tree sort, we have to build a BST. If length i is equal to zero, just return the area because I don't know why you would insert a zero member array. But in the other case, you will you know initialize your BST, then you insert each uh, element of the array you have just put in, and then you do the in order traversal. Uh, you make an empty res array beforehand so that you know your result has somewhere to go and present itself. And uh, yeah, you do this, and then finally you print tree sort. You can see this is our initial unsorted array right here. And then uh, the tree sort algorithm works, and this is our result 1 to 19, all sorted. Let's go. Um, yeah, all right. Now, moving on to heap sort. We'll do this and then we'll take a five minute break. I need water. Uh, heap sort is a comparison based sorting technique based on binary heap data structure. It is similar to the selection sort. <coughs> okay, uh, if you don't know what a heap tree is, uh, it's a slightly more organized random binary tree. Where if you have something like a min heap or a max heap, the absolute center of that tree just happens to be either maximum element uh, in case of max heap or minimum element in case of min heap. There's other organization, but uh, that's all you need to know right now. So anyway, it's similar to the selection sort where we first find the minimum element and place the minimum element at the beginning. This works really well for a min heap. And then you repeat the same process for the remaining elements. So the heap sort algorithm consists of two phases. In the first phase, array is converted into a max heap. And in the second phase, the highest element is removed. 
uh, that is the one at the tree root. Uh, you basically just pluck out the top element one by one, then you reheapify it, right? So the remaining elements are used to create a new maxi, and then you keep plucking out the top. Pluck out the top, rearrange. Pluck out the top, reheapify. That's uh, basically the point of heap sort. <clears throat> So moving on to the algorithm. <sighs> First, you convert the array into heap data structure using heapify. And then one by one, you delete the root node of the max heap. And then you replace it with the last node in the heap. And then heapify the root of the heap. That was a lot of times of saying the word heap. Doesn't matter. Just remember, pluck, reheapify, pluck, reheapify. Re uh, you keep uh, repeating not reheap, we repeat this process until the size of the heap is greater than one. Uh, build a heap from the given input array and repeat the following steps until the heap contains only one element. Swap the root element of the heap, which is the largest element with the last element of the heap. Uh, remove the last element of the heap, which is now in the correct position. Then you heapify the remaining elements of the heap. And the sorted array is obtained by reversing the order of the elements in the input array. That was a lot of words were saying puck and reheapify, but yes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so the advantages of heap sort is number one, efficient time complexity. Uh, heap sort has a time complexity of O of n log n. Uh, yeah, let's go back to my little index list. Uh, both tree sort and heap sort have the same time complexity, O of n log n. So works well for applications like these. Where did she go? There is. Uh, yeah, so it makes it efficient for sorting large data sets. Then the log n factor comes from the height of the binary heap. What's the height of a binary heap? Good question. Uh, as you can see here, the height of this guy is at least two. Or maybe it's the depth, anyway. So anyway, it ensures that the algorithm maintains good performance even with a large number of elements. Now moving on to memory usage. Memory usage can be minimal because apart from what is necessary to hold the initial list, it doesn't need additional memory space to work. So you'll notice that it is uh, a bit better than your merge sort, which requires extra space, maybe even quick sort. And uh, simplicity, it's actually simpler to understand than the other equally efficient sorting algorithms because it doesn't use advanced computer science concepts such as recursion. Uh, disadvantage heap sort is costly. Yeah. Uh, it's also not stable uh, because, again, that one point that keeps popping up, relative order of equivalent keys, uh, you're not supposed to change that, otherwise it, you're an unstable algorithm. Uh, and also, heap sort is not very efficient when working with very complex data. You know, works well for your uh, easy operations as so. So, uh, yeah, this is a pictorial diagram I've included. Um, as you can see, the given input element is your 9, 22, uh, 7, 8, 15, 25. Now, we just threw them into a binary tree. It just uh, by the order we were given. Um, <clears throat> so then uh, you'll notice that there's this little uh, swapping signal between 9 and 22. This is so that uh, we can create a max heap of uh, 9 and 22, and we place 22 at the very top. When we do this, we are also swapping 22 and 9 in the given input uh, array. And then uh, it's obvious that this is a max heap now because, well, for now, because like uh, 22, we're ignoring 25 at the moment because we haven't traversed it yet. Uh, 22 is the maximum element, so we just pluck it out and we put it at the zeroth index. Uh, yeah, then we move on to 9 and 15. You'll see that the swapping symbol is now between 9 and 15. We swap the two. Uh, and you can see here that uh, 15 and 9 were swapped in the input array as well as the tree. And then uh, you pluck it out. Then you fix it and you do this over and over again. This goes until 25 and then 25 is also swapped with 22. 
eventually. And thus, with your plucking, swapping, and reheapifying, you can um, sort your given input array. Now, moving on to a Python program for the implementation of heap sort. Uh, so to heapify the subtree rooted at index i, uh, and is also the size of the heap, you need a heapify function and a heap sort function. Heapify very important for obvious reasons. Uh, so basically, you just initialize the largest as root. We're creating a max heap, correct? And uh, this is the condition we apply for left and right. And then uh, you have to uh, check always if the left child of the root exists and if it's greater than the root. You know, if it has to, then you have to like swap. And then uh, you do the same for the right child. And then here, this is the change root if needed part. Uh, pretty easy swap, single line swap. And then you heapify recursively. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then here's the main function of heap sort. So we have to we first take n as the length of r. Then we build a max heap as we did here with this heapify function. Uh, this condition, uh, n, n by 2 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, is just uh, necessary to appropriately traverse, not traverse, sorry, to appropriately account for every element in the array and then introduce into the heap. So yeah, then you uh, heapify it, then you one by one extract the elements in this similar fashion. Here you'll see in for i in range of so, uh, similar reasons. And then here you'll notice a single line swap, and then you heapify again. So yeah, that's basically the premise of your heap sort function. Then moving on to driver's code, uh, we have an array, given array 12 to 7 here, uh, function call, whatever. And then this is our output, the sorted array is 5, 6, 11, 12, and 13. So yeah, and that brings us to the end of heap sort. We well, I'm going to take like a quick one minute break so I can get some water and then we move on to your slightly more fun sorting algorithms which build upon the basic concepts from bubble to quick counting sort and uh, yeah, BRB. <laughs> <sighs> all right i got water i won't die of dehydration let's go all right that was less than a minute but uh that's fine maybe i'll wait 10 more seconds 10 more seconds for our audience water trips relaxation trips I'm sorry if you can hear me drinking water. Really sorry. I know that's uncomfortable. Um. Uh, all right. All right. Ten seconds up, audience. All right. Moving back to our sorting algorithms. If you're still here after a recorded fifty-nine minutes. Um, you're either a really nice friend of mine or you're the board. And for that, I would like to thank you for sticking for so long. Uh, yes, your efforts are recognized. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on to bucket sort. So bucking, bu oh, sorry, bucket sort is a sorting technique that involves dividing elements into various groups or buckets. These buckets are formed by uniformly distributing the elements. Once the elements are divided into buckets, they can be sorted using any other sorting algorithm. And finally, the sorted elements are gathered together in an ordered fashion. Now, here's the main thing about bucket sort. You can use this for decimals. If you noticed, uh, none of these other ones before were very apt. 
for decimals. Counting sword literally said, no, I can't do decimals. But bucket sword can. Uh, moving on to the algorithm, you create n empty buckets or lists and do the following for every array element, out of i. You insert out of i into the bucket and into array of i. Then you sort the individual buckets using insertion sort. Uh, this is what I said when it builds upon the primary ones. You're using insertion sort and modifying it. And then you concatenate, concatenate, just like put together all the sorted buckets. So I included a slightly more detailed uh, pictorial diagram for this. So for that, let's move on to step one. So this is our input array, 0.78 to 0.68. And this is our, we have made a bucket for sorting each element, uh, zero to nine to fit all nine elements. And uh, we initialize them all at zero. Then uh, two, inserting the array into, uh, elements into respective buckets. Uh, a bucket is sort of like we kind of uh, express a range. So as you can see, 0 0.17 to 0 0.12. This is a range between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Uh, same stuff with 0 0.26, 0 0.21, 0 0.23. That's in a bucket. And uh, you'll notice we do the rest. Whatever vacant buckets there are, we just kind of put a slash there. It's a null bucket. <coughs> And uh, one thing to note here is that for multiple elements on the same bucket, linked list data structure will be used. It just makes more sense uh, if you use a linked list data structure. Uh, this is kind of reminiscent of a hash map, but uh, I don't really think that's what it's intended for. But yeah, uh, input array to bucket array, then you sort uh, each individual bucket. Each individual bucket is treated as a different linked list and sorted in ascending order. <clears throat> now you can use any stable sorting algorithm, but uh, I think here we said we use um, <clears throat> insertion sort because uh, that, that just makes more sense in this case. And then step four inserting buckets in ascending order into the resultant array. Uh, yeah, thus you can see bucket one, two, three, uh, six, seven, and nine corresponding to every index that was occupied put together. And then finally, you return the sorted array. Uh, yeah, all right, now moving on to the Python implementation. to sort an array using bucket sort. So we're using, we're first defining insertion sort function. Uh, this is a slightly optimized version of the exact insertion sort we did before. But yeah, so that's insertion sort. And now moving to bucket sort. So we're taking slot num is equal to 10. So that's like your number of slots, so 10 slots. So each slot size is 0 0.1, so range 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. <coughs> yeah. So for i in range of slot num, that sounds, that sounds weird, sorry. For i in range of that, you will append to the array, and then you put uh, array elements in different buckets for j and x, etc., etc. Uh, this chunk of code does exactly that. It's just a lot of appending and using this particular index loop chunk. And then uh, you sort the individual buckets, uh, as we saw in that step four of that example. And then you concatenate the results. You use uh, a variable k to show further indexing of uh, your output array. Uh, yeah, and then you return x, x is your array, and uh, that is your bucket sort. Uh, we use this driver code to test the same, and uh, this is our output, so yeah, it works. Y yippee! Uh, yeah, so that's our bucket sort, not to be confused with anything else, especially not counting sort.
and uh, moving on to comb sort. Now again, comb sort is an improvement over bubble sort. Uh, so bubble sort always compares the adjacent values. So inversions are removed one by one. So um, an inversion is sort of like, so an inversion count for an array indicates how far or close the array is from being sorted. So it's sort of like, how many steps do you have left to the completion of this task? Um, so if the array is already sorted, then the inversion count is zero. But if the array is sorted in reverse order, the inversion count is maximum. So yeah, anyway, coming back to comb sort. So comb sort it improves upon bubble sort by using a gap of the size more than one. So it's sort of like uh, if bubble sort uses a narrow tooth comb to swap every adjacent elements, the comb sort uses a wide tooth comb. Uh, girlies and people with long hair who pay attention to combs, you'll understand this analogy a bit better. But yeah, basically you just use a slightly bigger net um, to sort everything. So the gap starts with a large value and then shrinks, uh, shrinks by a factor of 1.3 in every iteration until it reaches the value of one. Thus, uh, comb sort re uh, removes more than one inversion count with one swap and performs better than bubble sort. Uh, the shrink factor has been empirically found to be 1.3. Uh, it just is that way. Um, a really good example of this is sort of like if you have really tangled hair and um, you want to you know sort every strand of hair, this is a really bad example, but it works. Uh, rather than using a narrow tooth comb and having maybe like 50 brushes, 50 strokes, to sort out your hair, it makes more sense to use a wide, very wide tooth comb to get rid of the bigger, uh, get rid of the bigger knots. Knots are figuratively elements. Then you move on to a narrower tooth comb. Again, people, girls and people with long hair might understand this better. But yeah, I, uh, that's basically your comb sort. Um, so it does work better than bubble sort on average but the worst case remains to be a win square. So again, like your bubble sort, probably best to use it on uh, an array with minimum inversions or like almost sorted arrays or partially sorted. Uh, yeah. So I included some more pictorial examples for comb sort because I really liked it. Um, so let the array elements be as given, 8 to 0 as you can see. So first we're taking the gap value of 10 and uh, run number 1. Run number 1, like uh, every stroke of a comb per se. So if our gap value is 10, brush through. Then we reduce the gap value by 1.3. This is our second run. Uh, compare and swap any values you know, with the gap of 7. As you can see, this was swapped in the second run, 428. And then um, we reduce the gap value further by 1.3. Uh, and we keep doing this until the sixth run. And uh, as you can see, minus 44 and 1, these also get uh, compared and swapped. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, with every run, you reduce the gap value, you compare and swap, it uh, is just a bit uh, objectively faster. And uh, yeah, so the array is finally sorted in this manner. Uh, yeah. Now moving on to the Python program for the implementation of comb sort. So um, you have to uh, make a function to find the next gradually decreasing by 1.3 gap. So we have def of uh, get next gap. And you um, shrink the gap by the shrink factor, empirically tested to be 1.3. Uh, makes more sense to uh, use this chunk of code. Gap is equal to gap into 10 divided by 13. You know, instead of dividing it by 1.3, that might get through all your net, or it's just better to do it this way. Uh, yeah. So if the gap is less than one, then you return one. Uh, that's your condition. 
and then you return the gap. And uh, yeah, now moving on to the comb sort function, uh, def comb sort of array and uh, length of array important in every sorting algorithm ever. Uh, you initialize the gap as n first, uh, like you saw in the example, there were 10 elements, the initial gap was just 10. Then you initialize swapped as true to make sure that the loop runs, the loop we're going to use that's born. Then you keep running while the gap is more than one and the last iteration has caused a swap. So when gap, uh, while gap uh, is not equal to one or swapped is equal to one, uh, that is true. You find the next gap, gap is equal to get next gap of gap and uh, that was a lot of times I said gap. Anyway, initialize the swapped as false so that we can check if swapped happened or not. And then when swapped is false, uh, that, that sort of breaks the loop a bit. It breaks it. And then you compare all the elements with the current gap. And uh, for i in this range, 0 to n minus gap, uh, this is your comparison and swapping. A uh, chunk of code, and then you enter a swap of shoe, which helps it re enter this loop. So, yeah. Anyway, now moving on to the driver code to test the above. You can see I've given an array here of 8 to 0. Uh, you comb sort this, and it works. The sorted array, uh, the sorted array is uh, this output. And uh, yeah, that was our comb sort. And now moving on to shell sort. Now shell sort is mainly a variation of insertion sort. So insertion sort, uh, we move elements only one position ahead. So when an element has to be moved far ahead, many movements are involved. You know, every individual one step. So the idea of shell sort is to allow the exchange of our items. So we make the array edge sorted for a large value of edge, kind of similar to comb sort if you see. You take a larger gap and you reduce it. Uh, and then we keep reducing the value of edge until it becomes one. An array is said to be edge sorted if all sublists sub <coughs> sub lists of every hth element are sorted. <sighs> Alright. <clears throat> Anyway, moving on to the algorithm. Step one, start. That was, oh, okay, yeah. So you initialize the value of the gap size, or h. Then you divide the list into smaller subparts. Each must have equal intervals of h. Then you sort these individuals using insertion sort, insertion, insertion sort. Used a lot in your um, two-part sort, such as your shell comb and uh, other by counting applications. So then you repeat sub step two until the list is sort. Then you print and stop. Now, moving on to the applications of shell sort. Shell, shell sort. She sorts shells by the sorting scene. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, applications, the replacement for insertion sort. Uh, where it takes a long time to complete a given task, gamified insertion sort. Then uh, you can use this to call stack overhead. Um, st any stack trace, any stack overhead, it's used for that. And then when recursion exceeds a particular limit, we use shell sort. And uh, you can use it for medium to large size data sets. And in insertion sort, you can reduce the number of operations. Just uh, make... make uh, the sorting algorithm have fewer steps than, you know, there otherwise would have been. So I have a pictorial diagram right here. There is an unsorted er uh, array of elements from four to five. And uh, on the left side, you'll see how insertion sort works, where you compare with every single element placed on the left side and then insert in the correct position. Uh, you, do, you do this manually, step by step. You can see by the arrows. And then shell sort, uh, compare and swap with smaller. We just took a large h, I think h here was um 
free. So yeah, a lot, a lot simpler. So yeah. Now, anyway, yeah. Sorry, the h was actually three here. Gap is equal to n divided by two. So now, moving on to the Python program for the implementation of cells. Shell, shell sort. Yes. Uh, def of shell sort. Uh, <clears throat> now I forgot to write this entirely, but yeah, gap is equal to n by n divided by two. And while gap is uh, greater than zero, j is equal to gap. You check the array from left to right till the last possible index of j. While j is less than n, i is equal to j minus gap. This will help keep uh, help in maintaining the gap value. And while i is greater than zero, if uh, the value on the right side is already greater than the left side value, we don't do swap, else we swap fair enough. Uh, this if break, otherwise swap. Then i minus i cap. This is to check the left side also. If the element present is greater than a current element, and yeah, so on and so forth. Keep reducing the gap size by two by two, and uh, yeah. And uh, here we have the driver code. This is our input array, twelve to three, and uh, it works. Our sorted array, sorted output is thus so. Uh, yeah. All right. Now, finally, moving on to pigeonhole sort. So the, I think this is our penultimate sorting algorithm. Now, the pigeonhole sorting uh, is a sorting algorithm that is suitable for sorting lists of elements where the number of elements and the number of possible key values are approximately the same. Uh, it requires O of n plus range time, where n is the number of elements in input array, and range is the number of possible values in an array. Um, so how, basically, so how there are pigeonholes of varying sizes, like varying diameters. Uh, like say you have a one inch diameter and a two inch diameter, and then a three inch diameter. You sort of visualize your elements to fit in those uh, diameters as per their key values. Uh, when they're approximately the same, and then you can uh, sort your pigeonholes easily. So the working of the algorithm is you find the minimum and maximum values in the array, and you let the minimum and maximum values be min and max respectively. And then you have to also have to find the range as max minus um, min plus one, obviously. Then you set up an array of initially empty pigeonholes, the same size of the range. Then you visit each uh, element of the array and put each element in its pigeonhole. Uh, this is not in a negative sense. <laughs> an, a, an element of arrowwise put in hole at index arrowwise minus one, min, sorry. Then uh, you start the loop all over the pigeon array in order, and then you put the elements from non-empty holes back in the original array. So comparison with counting sort, yeah, like counting sort also had a bunch of uh, equal key values and it's frequency based, but uh, it's similar. But it differs in that it moves items twice, once to the bucket array and once to the final destination. Counting sort just sort of uh, jump didn't really move it twice, it just moved it like once. So uh, yeah. Now you can see here in uh, pigeonhole sort versus counting sort, left versus right. I like this example, it has a cat in it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so as you can see, uh, your values of cat, ear, and tie have, uh, say, a one-inch diameter pigeonhole. Uh, and mop has two, and pin, ton, and till have three. And uh, this is basically how you're sorting each of the elements in their pigeonholes and presenting them. And in counting sort, uh, you'll see that uh, we have instead sorted them as per their numbers. And... Uh, then that's so uh, the sorted output in both is uh, you start with your ones, then your singular two, and then your threes. So uh, yeah. Uh, moving on to the Python program, I included some links here as well. Anyway, uh, you can go through this more in detail, but I am I'm content with this. Uh, <laughs> So def pigeonhole sort, the size of range of values in the list, uh, that is the number of pigeonholes we need. 
uh, we start with a min and a max, then we take the size to be max minus 1 plus 1, we get our list of pigeonholes, and then we populate the pigeonholes. I think that's a really nice comment. And then for x and a, uh, a certain type is just int, integers only, if, even if it's like a cat tie mop. And then uh, you perform this operation on each holes to populate. And then you put the elements back in the array in order, which uh, makes sense. You use a comparison operator and then you sort. And uh, yeah, this is our driver code right here. Uh, this is your input array, 8 to another 8, uh, identical key values, important part. And then you sort it. And then finally, you get the sorted order as follows, this output right here. Uh, it is at this point, I will remember to go over the time complexities of the last three sorting algorithms we just did. Um, where is it? So as you can see, comb sort and shell sort, because they're so similar to your bubble and insertion, they have the same time complexity, O of n square. Pigeonhole, we just saw it's O of n plus range. And then we move on to the final Tim sort, uh, which is your O of n uh, into log n. And uh, because of this particular time complexity, you'll find that it's very useful um, in other applications. And uh, we will discover that right now. Um, okay, now Tim sort. So Tim sort is a hybrid sorting algorithm derived from merge sort and insertion sort. It was designed to perform well on many kinds of real world data. TimSort is the default sorting algorithm used by Python sorted and this throat sort functions. This is what I was talking about. Um, so yeah, so the main idea behind TimSort is to exploit the existing order in the data to minimize number of comparisons and swaps. That's been a common theme in the past three um, <coughs> sorting algorithms. It achieves this by dividing the array into small subarrays called runs, which are already sorted and then merging these runs using a modified merge sort algorithm. So how does Tim sort work? Let's, let's consider this following array as an example. Array, you can see here, this thing, four to seven. So define the size of the run. Uh, we usually ignore this part if the run size is small, but it's important in the Python implementation. So the minimum run size has to be 32. Uh, Yeah, then you divide the array into runs. So in this step, we'll use insertion sort to sort the small subsequences or runs within the array. Initial array is this, no initial runs are present. So we create runs using insertion sort. So our sorted runs will be two and four, six and eight, one, five, nine, and three and seven. Then thus, this is our updated array. Uh, where it's, where you've basically just sort of uh, presenter each sorted run as is and then uh what you do is you merge the runs in the third step so then you merge the sorted runs using a modified merge sort algorithm so you merge the runs until the entire array is sorted so thus as you can see this is our updated array and uh, you'll see this still isn't uh perfect so then you have to adjust the run size so after each merge operation, we have to double the size of the run uh, until it exceeds the length of the array. Uh, you see, this is kind of similar to your comb sort, uh, in the, but it's uh, increasing rather than reducing. You just take a wider and wider net. So yeah, the run size doubles, 32, 64, 128. Uh, we can ignore this since our array is small, but uh, it'll still be useful in the code. And then you continue merging. Then you repeat the merging process until the entire array is sorted. And then this is your final merged run. And you return your final sorted array. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. And uh, yeah. So this is a pictorial representation. As you can see, we have split it in two runs or in three size indexes. Then here is where you sort of use a gamified merge sort. Uh, where you keep dividing and conquering per se and then you'll notice at the end we finally merge so uh yeah that's your pictorial representation of 
Tim sort and uh, moving on to the Python program to perform basic Tim sort. Uh, so min run, min merge 32. So when you put uh, the function of calculating min run, it returns the minimum length of a run from 23 to 64 so that the length of array divided by min run is <clears throat> less than or equal to a power of two. So yeah, as you can see in this, com in this comment here, so yeah, so r is equal to zero, well n is greater than min of merge. Array bitwise operator so and so. And uh, yeah, this function sorts array from the left index to the right index, which is of size at most run. Def insertion sort, this is where this comes in. So uh, yeah, and then finally we move on to a merge. I realized I kept saying merge sort, uh, this is just the merge part of the merge sort, sorry. Uh, yeah. So then you, the original array is broken into two parts, left and right array, now then one, then two, so on and so forth. After comparing, we merge those two arrays in a larger sub-array. And uh, yeah, then you copy elements of the left. Good, a good time to just traverse it once again. Do the same for the right. And then there's also an iterative time sort function which is more similar to merge sort. Uh, yeah, so either of these can work. So, def of tim sort. Uh, anyway, yeah. Def of tim sort, uh, where you take your min run, sort the individual arrays of size of run, then you start merging from size run or 32. Then it will merge to form the size 64, 128, so on and so forth. And uh, size is min 1, so on and so forth. Now pick the starting point of the left sub array. We are going to merge the array of uh, left to left plus size minus 1, and the array of left plus size, so and so. And after every merge, we increase the left by 2 into size. So then we find the ending point of the left sub array. Min plus 1 is the starting of the right sub array. And you have to merge uh, the right and left after this step. So yeah, finally we have the driver program to test the above function. Uh, this is our given input array and uh, call the function. And uh, this is our output after sorting array, uh, sorted list of the given. As you can see, this is really uh, useful for larger data sets. It really is uh, the most gamified version. And that's why it's used in, you know, your default Python libraries. Not libraries, sorry, just default Python keyword. So uh, yeah, uh, that is the end of this session. Thank you for tuning in. Here is a cat holding a flower for you if you stayed this long. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session I held. And uh, I hope that uh, you tune in for the next session. Uh, I think it's Searching Algorithms by Tanushri Kaushik next Saturday. Hope you're there for that as well. Thank you so much for coming here on your Christmas Eve <laughs> at 9 p.m. Uh, just to learn more about sorting algorithms or just to supervise whatever the hell the junior core is doing as a board member. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, once again, I'm Nasha Mishra. I'll see you guys later. All right. Bye. Good night. Merry Christmas if you celebrate. <laughs>